Good morning, boys and girls. Um, we're back to a long walk to water, and Dash is going to settle in here for um, the read, I guess. And today, in chapter 17, I want you to consider this idea. What is the importance of school and family? Um, if you look at Naya and you look at Salva, those ideas keep coming back again and again. So I want to just look into, investigate, what is, what is going on there? And is there a connection or a relationship between school and family it, that's not like overt, but that you can infer, okay? So I want you to think about this concept as I read to you today. Chapter 17, Southern Sudan, 2009. What do you think we are building here? Naya's father asked, smiling. A house? Naya guessed, or a barn? Her father shook his head. Something better, he said. A school. Naya's eyes widened. The nearest school was a half day's walk from their home. Naya knew that because Deep had wanted to go there, but it was too far. A school, she echoed. Yes, he replied. With the well here, no one will have to go to the pond anymore. So all the children will be able to go to school. Naya stared at her father. Her mouth opened, but no words came out. When at last she was able to speak, it was only a whisper. All the children, Papa? The girls, too? Her father's smile grew broader. Yes, Naya. Girls, too, he said. Now go and fetch water for us. And he returned to his work, scything the long grass. So, she's gonna get to go to school. Can you imagine being that excited to do homework? Naya went back and picked up the plastic can. She felt as if she were flying. School, she would learn to read and write, exclamation point. Wow. Sudan and Rochester, New York, 2003 to 2007. Salva stood at the foot of one of the beds in the crowded clinic. Hello, he said. Hello, the patient replied politely. I have come to visit you, Salva said. To visit me, the man frowned. But who are you? You are Mawin Duet Arik, aren't you? Yes, that is my name. Salva smiled, his insides trembling. Even though his father looked older now, Salva had recognized him right away. But it was as if his eyes needed help from his ears. He needed to hear his father's words to believe he was real. I am your son. I am Salva. The man looked at Salva and shook his head. No, he said, it is not possible. Yes, Salva said, it is me, father. He moved to the side of the bed. Mao and Dua reached out and touched the arm of his, this tall stranger beside him. Salva, he whispered, can it really be you? Salva waited. Mao and Duet stared for a long moment. Then he cried out, Salva, my son, my son. His body shaking with sobs of joy, he reached up to hug Salva tightly. It had been almost 19 years since they had last seen each other. 19 years, boys and girls. Mao and Duet sprinkled water on his son's head, the dink away of blessing someone who had, was lost and is found again. Everyone was sure you were dead, Mao and Duet said. The village wanted to kill a cow for you. That was how Salva's people mourned the death of a loved one. I would not let them, his father said. I never gave up hope that you were still alive somewhere. And, and my mother, Salva asked, barely daring to hope. His father smiled. She is back in the village. Salva wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. I must see her. But his father shook his head. There is still war in Luarik, my son. If you went there, both sides would try to force you to fight with them. You must not go. There was so much more to talk about. His father told Salva that his three sisters were with his mother, but of his three brothers, only Ring had survived the war. Eric, the oldest, and Kulo, the youngest, were both dead. Little Kulo, Salva closed his eyes for a moment, trying to picture his brothers 
through a haze of time and grief. He learned more about his father's illness. Years of drinking contaminated water had left Mao and Duet's entire digestive system riddled with guinea worms. Sick and weak, he had walked almost 300 miles to come to this clinic and was barely alive by the time he finally arrived. Salva and his father had several days together, but all too soon, it was time for Salva to return to America. His father would be leaving the clinic shortly as well. The surgery he had undergone had been successful, and he would soon be strong enough to make the long walk home. I will come to the village, Salva promised, as soon as it is safe. We will be there waiting for you, his father promised in turn. Salva pressed his face tightly to his father's as they hugged goodbye, their tears flowing and blending together. On the plane back to the United States, Salva replayed in his mind every moment of his visit with his father. He felt again the coolness of his brow when his father had sprinkled the water blessing on him. And an idea came to him, an idea of what he might be able to do to help the people of Sudan. Could he do it? It would take so much work. Perhaps it would be too difficult. But how would he know unless he tried? Back in Rochester, Salva began working on his idea. There were, it seemed, a million problems to be solved. He needed a lot of help. Chris and Louise gave him many suggestions. Scott, a friend of theirs, was an expert in setting up projects like this, the one Salva had in mind. He and Salva worked together for hours and days, which grew into weeks and months. Along the way, Salva met other people who wanted to help. He was grateful to all of them. But even with their help, it was much more work than he had imagined. Salva had to raise money for the project, and there was only one way to do this. He would have to talk to people and ask them to give money. The first time Salva spoke in front of an audience was in a school cafeteria. About a hundred people had come to hear him. There was a microphone at the front of the room. Salva's knees were shaking as he walked to the mic. He knew that his English was still not very good. What if he made mistakes in pronunciation? What if the audience couldn't understand him? But he had to do it. If he didn't talk about the project, no one would learn about it. No one would donate money, and he would never be able to make it work. Salva spoke into the microphone. Hello, he said. At that moment, something went wrong with the sound system. The speakers behind him let out a dreadful screech. Salva jumped and almost dropped the mic. His hands trembling, he looked out at the audience. People were smiling or chuckling. A few of the children were holding their ears. They all looked very friendly, and seeing the children made him remember. It was not the first time he had spoken in front of a large group of people. Years before, when he was leading the boys on their walk from the Ethiopian refugee camp to the one in Kenya, he had called a meeting every morning and evening. The boys would line up facing him and he would talk to them about their plans. All those eyes looking at him, but every face interested in what he had to say, it was the same here. The audience had come to the school cafeteria because they wanted to hear him. Thinking of that made him feel a little better, and he spoke into the mic again. Hello, he repeated, and this time only his own voice came from the speakers. He smiled in relief and went on. I am here to talk to you about a project for Southern Sudan. A year passed, then two, then three. Salva spoke to hundreds of people in churches, at civic organizations and schools. Would he ever be able to turn his idea into reality? Whenever he found himself losing hope, Salva would take a deep breath and think of his uncle's words, a step at a time, one problem at a time. Just figure out this one problem. Day by day, solving one problem at a time, Salva moved toward his goal. Boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed that. I do want you to think about what is the importance of school and family? Is there a connection? So that's what I want you to be considering now. And um, I'll look forward to sharing another chapter with you later. Take care. Bye.